Hi, fam. Can you believe we're already halfway through December? I mean, I'm pinching myself because time is such a thief, you know? The days can feel long, but the weeks are so short. But at the same time, I am excited because today we are welcoming the infamous Carl Robbins LCPC to come hang out with us. So settle in, because we are talking about all things OCD. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family. The OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Okay, bam. So, For starters, I want to extend a happy Hanukkah to any of our family that observes as this year's celebration is wrapping up. And for our Christmas embracing fam, we are a blink away from Christmas and all the things. For a lot of businesses where fiscal years may run in accordance with the calendar year, this can also be a really busy season of trying to wrap up those last few loose ends before the new fiscal year begins. Kiddos are going to be on school break, and life can feel pretty busy overall. So if that's you, if you're like, Nicole, get out of my head, I'm just saying, fam, you're not alone. It's a busy season, it can be overwhelming, and it's easy to get lost in the importance of it all. But I can say for myself, I'm really trying to be very intentional with where I'm putting my focus, partly in an effort to survive. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But mostly because I don't want to get so lost in the story about what's important that I'm actually missing the important stuff. So that's what I've been working on this holiday season. And you know what? So, so far, so good. It really does make a difference. And I not only love that for me, but I love how that ties into what we're going to be discussing today and next week, fam, with Carl Robbins. Now, for many folks, Carl Robbins needs no introduction, as he has been a leader in our field, and even more specifically within the treatment of OCD and other anxiety-related disorders. He is the co-director at the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland, along with a fam favorite, Mike Hetty, and he is really well known within our specialty for launching the dissemination of inference-based CBT into the U.S. treatment scene. He has also focused time and attention to better understanding Metacognitive Therapy Act, which is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, as well as offering ERP, which is Exposure and Response Prevention Therapy for any newer fam joining us. Carl treats, trains, teaches, and consults, and yet, amidst that very busy schedule, he has still made time to come hang out with us fam, even during this busy season. So thank you, Carl, for spending the time and investing in the fam, not only with these chats, but in all of the ways you've supported the growth of treatment options, that's plural, options, for our OCD warriors. So without further ado, let's jump into the first of two conversations I'm hosting with Carl because the concepts are so important and yet so meaty that I think we will appreciate the extra time to chew on these concepts. So to the first course we go. Welcome, Carl Robbins, to the OCD Family Podcast. And we are in for a treat today, y'all, because Carl, you have been cited and credited well with your passion for bringing this treatment option of hope in inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy to the U.S. and really banding together with so many clinicians of lived experience and researchers and really looking at data and research internationally as well as within the U.S., And so it is such an honor to have you at OCD Family Podcast today. Thank you for coming and hanging out with me. Great to be here. So, Carl, part of your story that is so interesting, which you have been open about sharing within the ICBT community, and I imagine for a while, because you've been in the field, 
And you've really seen it evolve. Would love for the fam here to hear a little more about your personal journey into treating OCD and what shifts you've seen over the years. Well, I like to say that I was born in the Jurassic period of OCD. <laughs> Back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, I am now in my early 70s. And in addition to being in the field for almost 40 years, OCD found me in the early 60s. And this was actually before what could be seen as the modern era of OCD treatment, which was really probably started in 1965 with the work of Victor Meyer mm -hmm. at Sussex Hospital, who did the first ever ERP. And so, you know, it's, it's been interesting that my own sort of lived experiences follow the, the evolution of OCD treatment. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that, that, you know, in the sixties and seventies, mm -hmm. uh, while there was the beginning of cognitive behavioral work mm -hmm. by Edna Fowler and Rockman and others, the view in the psychiatric community that was largely dominated by psychoanalysis was that OCD was extremely rare mm -hmm. and very difficult to treat. Mm -hmm. So it was for those of us baby boomers, it, it was quite an odyssey to sort of find our way through. And I think that discovering self-administered ERP Mm -hmm. was an important part. And, and in terms of my own personal journey, what I realized was during a big OCD flare up when I was in college, mm -hmm. I realized that I sort of stumbled upon ACT principle. Mm. And in fact, that a transformational moment for me was, I had a lot of scrupulosity and it was, gee, if I stop doing this kind of crazy stuff, then maybe I'll be able to make a real contribution to the world. <laughs> and that became this sort of pivot point of sort of a values-based, you know, non-compulsive, non-avoidant approach to living my life. And as it turns out, I eventually became a therapist yeah. and I made some contributions to the field. So major contributions to the field, Carl, you're, you're. <laughs> So I'm reminded of, of a quote attributed to Robert Bly, which is where you are wounded will be your greatest contribution to society. Right. And certainly our field, particularly OCD community is full of people who have used their own personal suffering as motivation and interest to end up being clinicians and helping other, other people find yeah. their way through this. Yeah. It's an interesting point. Because it was so fresh on the scene and there wasn't a lot of hope for OCD. And, and we have to realize, too, mental health at large at that point wasn't that developed. We had Freud coming out with ideas of psychoanalysis in, what, the 50s? And really the budding of the mental health field and the evolution of cognitive behavioral therapy and all of that was pretty fresh. But understanding that there wasn't a lot of hope for OCD... How were you able to even learn that what you were struggling with was actually OCD and not, for example, scrupulosity or faith or morality-based fear that you were really just kind of wrestling with? Sometimes people consider that as part of their, I don't know, if, if it's within faith, part of their journey, their faith journey or whatnot. Like, how were you able to distinguish the differences? Because I think even now it's hard for people to catch. And I would imagine mm -hmm. back then, especially in a psychoanalytic world, it would mm -hmm. have been really, really hard to catch. So were you able to discover that for yourself? Did you have someone help point that out or what was that like? Great question. You know, I would say that there was back in the 70s mm -hmm. that was still dominated by DSM-2, oh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And there is mention of OCD in there. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how much I used that label or from a psychoanalytic perspective, sort of all anxiety, panic, obsessive compulsive disorder is seen as a symptom, right? Right. And to sort of address any of that stuff on a quote symptom level was sort of seen as superficial mm -hmm. and not really getting to the heart of the matter, which was In the you unconscious. Know, unconscious internal conflict based on developmental issues, either trauma or family related stuff. Mm -hmm. So while I was both having panic attacks, as well as 
clear OCD at times, it was sort of seen as, well, this is just in this general bucket of having anxiety problems. Yeah. And so, yes, for many of us during that time, we had to find our own way. Right. And now what's interesting, and I think that this is worth a study, is that many of us did find our way through that through those periods, through these sort of flare-ups of either panic or OCD, right? Mm -hmm. Find our way through without any direct treatment of the conditions. Mm -hmm. I will say that at the time, I saw a couple of really, really good psychiatrists that had, or psychotherapy, yeah, and that I think I had a good relationship with. And I think that that was sort of part of it. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, it is, it is an interesting question, which is, how did we get through it? right? Without what we now know about direct targeted treatment of ERP or ICBT or other cognitive methods or ACT or yeah. whatever. Yeah. It's a really interesting question. Yeah. It's been a huge shift. And I think as with anything, any parent especially can relate when you're going through a hardship, say for one of your kids or whatnot, or people that are dealing with medical battles, you think of cancer or something like that. And people are like, oh, how, how have you gotten through that? And they're like, I didn't have a choice but to get through it. You just survive and then you blink and you look back and you go, oh, that was hard. But sometimes it's hard to parse out where in the journey you just survived. And I think so many people even now are looking at things like OCD and certainly a lot of our family audience here that is tuning in have just been surviving. Sometimes for decades, sometimes they're like, no, we're just learning about it and orienting. But often as folks learn more, they realize, no, we've been surviving this. It's just snowballed so gradually that the avalanche cued us in that something seriously is going on here. But you can look back and see how it accumulated in hindsight. And so I, I, I think that's pretty powerful. And considering where it came from. ERP was even a huge, like you said, just treating symptom management was a, a huge shift in the tide in terms of treatment options. Now we're also looking at inference-based CBT. And when we look at inference-based CBT, which is very different, not better, worse, or anything else, it's an option. It's a good option. It has a researched evidence-based background. And that's what we want. We want to know that the things that we're taking the time to invest in that we're doing in treatment actually can help and show that it does help. And so in terms of ICBT, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking at a high level about what is going on with the OCD sufferer, with your loved one, or if you have lived experience, what's going on for you? And we talk about this idea in ICBT as going into the bubble. And so what we're going to be touching on today is the process of when we are in these OCD stories, these obsessional sequences, how we can get really yanked out of our present reality. And we're going to be talking about dissociation more broadly. And so I'm so excited to have you here to speak on this because you have done a lot of great research into this and have brought this to the awareness of a lot of the treatment community as well. But I would wonder if you could just start maybe with a accessible understanding of the bubble for family members that may be tuning in and not aware of ICBT, or even if they are doing ICBT, maybe just some language that can help scaffold their understanding of what's going on in that process. Okay. Could we even sort of talk about what do we mean by a dissociation? Oh, please. Yes. Let's do it. I will fly on your kite strings okay. here. Just as long as we can make it accessible for the fam, we are good. Yeah. But yes, please. Okay. So whenever the term dissociation is mentioned, and I've actually done this experiment with clinicians, uh -huh. and you say, what's the, what's the first thing that pops in your mind when you think about the dissociation? And people think about trauma right? Mm -hmm. That dissociation, and we can get into specific definition in a little while, but that dissociation is this reaction, this strong reaction to a traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that that happens, right? Mm -hmm. and, and immediately we think of dissociative disorders like 
dissociative identity disorder it used to be called multiple personality disorder, mm -hmm. where the self sort of breaks into parts, discrete parts, right? Right. Or, or depersonalization, derealization disorder, right? And so what's happened is that the understanding of dissociation has been left largely to the trauma community. Mm -hmm. But there have been some researchers that have sort of taken a look at the dissociation mm -hmm. as being a, a normal experience. And we can talk about that. There are normal experiences of a dissociation. Mm -hmm. And, and that also is that the less severe forms of dissociation can in fact contribute to psychopathology. Mm -hmm. Probably the uh, number one researcher in this area is a brilliant psychologist at Ben Gurion University in Israel, a woman by the name of Narit Sofer Dudek. Mm -hmm. And she published a paper, for example, in 2014, showing that dissociation, mm -hmm. and we'll drill down into what do we mean specifically by that, plays a part in not only OCD, but in panic disorder and even in depression. Okay, so what do we mean by a dissociation? And it means so many different things to so many people. It's one of these words that are almost like mindfulness, which sort of means so many different things to so many people. Right. But basically, it's this idea that aspects of mental functioning, mm -hmm. all right, split apart, disconnect, mm -hmm. right? And there can be an attention or, or an involvement with one part to the obliviousness of all the other parts. All right. So can I ask so, you a quick question, Carl? Sure. Sorry to interrupt you there. How would you distinguish that from someone that may be compartmentalizing? Because I think some fam tuning in here might go, okay, but like sometimes you have to break things apart, right? Like if you're a doctor treating cancer, yeah. you're going to have kids or adults, depending on what age group you work with, that are going to die and that's going to affect you. But you also have people that you're going to be able to help say, right? So how do, what, how would you separate? That's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, so let's say, let's take your example of a cancer doctor mm -hmm. who comes home and needs to help with dinner, you yeah. know? And so what's happening is, is that they have the skill to sort of be able to put that aside, right? Right. But it's not out of awareness. It's not out of consciousness. It's not split off. There isn't this aspect of obliviousness while he's fixing dinner, helping to fix dinner, or she is fixing dinner. He still knows that he's a cancer doctor, right? Right. Right. But, but he's saying that here is, you know, I'm choosing to focus here. Here are my priorities. Yeah. All right. Okay. As opposed to dissociation tends to have this aspect of obliviousness, of mindlessness. Mm, okay. Right. Okay. So, so let's talk about the three forms of a dissociation. There's something called the dissociative experiences scale, and they identify three different aspects of a dissociation. One is amnesia, mm -hmm. this, this experience of forgetting, mm -hmm. right? Something that's happened or this experience that you've had. Mm -hmm. There is also depersonalization and derealization, which is this idea that one feels either disconnected from oneself mm -hmm. or feel disconnected from a reality. Again, this theme of disconnection. And the third subscale that we're particularly interested in is what's called imaginal absorption. Mm -hmm. And this tendency to, to become immersed, absorbed, lost in one's imagination mm -hmm. and oblivious to what else is going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, let me just say something. I, before I said something about parts, what I mean is aspects of mental functioning, not parts of the self. So let's talk about what are everyday experiences of a dissociation. All right. So let's consider something that almost everybody who has ever driven a car has experienced is something called highway hypnosis, mm -hmm. which is that you're driving down the road and you get to your destination and you realize that you had no idea how you got there. Yeah. Right? right. Right. And that, and that you were sort of lost elsewhere, probably in a daydream and being immersed in a daydream as a form of normal dissociation. Yeah. It's like going into autopilot kind of thing. Like that, that's the other thing, right? Is that, but you were still able to drive a car, right? So autopilot, 
And fortunately, once you've been driving for a while, you can sort of do that mindlessly, right? You, you don't have to have a lot of your attention directed into the moment, right? right? Is that your mind can sort of wander off into these daydreams, right? Right. But but what happens is that actually highway hypnosis shows actually two of those forms of a dissociation. One is that you've been gone. You've been off in some daydream somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. That imaginal absorption. And then the other is that you have no memory of actually stopping at that red light four intersections ago. And that would be amnesia. And then one of the things that is interesting to sort of think about is that if you consider hit and run OCD, right? Very often when, when you come out of that trance, mm -hmm. right? And you realize you haven't been paying full attention. If that's a vulnerable theme for you, then you can start to doubt, oh my God, what might've happened while I wasn't paying attention. Right. Yeah. Right. Can I ask too, in terms of this process, the highway hypnosis too, because sometimes I think, and I've heard this, this feedback before of like, well, isn't that just kind of rote memory? Like we don't have to think about all the mechanics of what we're doing and how we're doing it. We just go into that practice habitually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, yes, indeed. Indeed. That's what we call sort of autopilot, right? It's not something where we need to sort of pay strict attention to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll give you another example of this. I was taking a shower a couple of days ago and I was sort of thinking about our upcoming podcast and I was imagining talking to you and I could hear your warm voice, oh. and, you know, and your friendly style and your inquisitiveness, et cetera. And I wasn't at all paying attention to what I was doing in the shower. Right. right? So, so again, that is a normal form of imaginal absorption. And not only that, but also it can be useful, right? You know, the imagination is a wonderful tool. Being absorbed in the imagination is a wonderful tool. It can be part of planning. Right. I'm thinking about up, right? So again, it, this isn't a bad thing. This right. isn't to demonize, right? So let me also give some other examples of normal dissociation, yeah. right? Which is maybe then takes us closer to what happens in OCD. And we think about going to a scary movie or reading a scary book, their attention is not directed inward to our own scary story, but to somebody else's scary story, mm -hmm. right? And if you think about the last time you went to a horror movie or scary suspenseful movie, you are absorbed in somebody else's narrative. Right. And what the thing is, is that is that the director and the screenwriter and the actor and the cinematographer have all these tricks to suck you in and make you experience it. But you are in the story when you are immersed in it and you can actually feel the scared. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you can emotionally feel scared. You can, your palms can sweat, yeah. right? Your, your heart can beat fast. You can get an urge to run out of the theater or, or run out of your home these days with streaming, right? And then this is in many ways, you know, a useful metaphor for what happens in OCD, because then what ha you sort of snap out of it and you realize it's just a movie. Right. And when you realize it's just a movie, there's nothing to do. You don't have to avoid, you don't have to compulse, you don't have to do anything. Now, what's really important though, is that even though you realize it's just a movie, you may still have the residual arousal from having been immersed right and to misconstrue that as evidence that there really was danger oh my god if my heart is beating fast and my palms are sweaty there must be some danger here right right and this becomes a kind of emotional reasoning that we often see in ocd right and this can't just be my imagination right if i'm feeling so frightened or i'm feeling so aroused that's such a great point, because especially as we talk about inference-based CBT and for any new listeners that are joining us, so really it's learning to use your five senses and your common sense reality here in the present. I will hear this feedback, especially in the beginning. As we get into it, people, it all integrates and makes a lot of sense, and then, and then they're on their way. But especially in the beginning, folks will be like, but I do have direct evidence. They use the heart palpitation. They use that sensory evidence within their own body. And they're like, that's here. That's now. It is. <laughs> I'm feeling it. 
But the point that you're making is just like we can be absorbed into that story in the scary movie. We're in the story. And yes, our body, our minds are going to respond. That's not evidence of danger in the moment. That's evidence of the power of the story. Exactly. It's the evidence of the power of the story, of the uh, narrative. Here's uh, another way of sort of reframing this that, that people sometimes find helpful. Mm -hmm. If you think about the amygdala, the amygdala is the fear center of the brain, right? The fear center of the brain has a front door and a back door, Yeah. right? And the front door is what we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, right? But it also has a back door. And the back door are the images and the narratives that we can generate internally yeah. that can also activate the amygdala. Right. Right. So in a fundamental sense, what ICBT is here to say is, is that there's a fundamental distinction to be made between what's activating the amygdala. What is frightening us? Is an actual real threat coming in from the outside? Mm -hmm. Right. Or is it something that we are imagining and supporting a narrative based on all the tricks in the same way that in a scary movie, a director and a cinematographer have these neat tricks to sort of draw us in and make it feel so real right. in the same way that's, that's what the OCD does. This is the cognitive piece. This is the reasoning piece. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is that if I feel scared and I feel all of this arousal. There must be something to the story. But yeah. of course, you don't do that when you go to a scary movie. Right. When you go to a scary movie and you are absorbed, and that is a form of a dissociation. Imaginal absorption could be both about internal contents, but also about external stuff. Yeah. And when you're absorbed in a movie and the guy revs up that chainsaw, your heart is going to beat fast and you're going to get an urge to run and your palms are going to sweat. Yeah. Right. And it, quote, feels so real. So... That's why it's so important to understand imaginal absorption because it is, as Fred and Kieran say, a lived-in experience. It feels real. And the thing is, is that, is that once the amygdala is activated, it feels the same from the standpoint of the fight or flight response. Right. So, so it's important to be able to sort of distinguish between is this coming in the front door or the back door? And it can draw in stuff like hearsay and out of context facts that can make it so convincing. But in a fundamental way, when you're able to sort of step back, it's the moment in the movie theater when somebody sneezes and you realize it's just a movie. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. This is coming from my imagination and the story I'm telling myself rather than any danger in the here and now. Yeah, you know what's interesting? So I'm not a big fan of shock, I'm sure, but I'm not a big fan of scary movies. But I remember going on vacation with a friend and her family when I was junior high, maybe high school, early high school. We went and saw, I think it was What Lies Beneath with like, I don't know, Harrison Ford ended up being a bad guy. And it was a hard movie for me. A lot of sudden camera angles where they're like inducing panic and fear or whatnot right but we were down in florida and for those that are outside of the u.s florida is quite the tropical draw for tourists and down in where we were there was a very interactive quality to the movie crowd that i wasn't used to but it was enjoyable right people were like talking to the screen and responding <laughs> Like, you better not go in there. He's back there or whatever, you know. It was, it was all very interesting. But I remember watching it, and again, not my favorite, and like just squirming in my seat here. And I remember somebody making a comment at one point during that film where they're like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> like, this is like, you better watch out. And everybody broke out in like this anxious laughter. But it was like this collective moment, and, I'm, and it just made me think of it now, of not just one person breaking from that, but everyone feeling the residual ah, anxiety in the moment. And this person bridged back just in that comment for everybody to be able to exhale and go, yeah, like this is the movie. It's like a, it's like a spell or a trance was broken. Yeah. Right? Corporately. 
And then the laughter is the relief yes. that when you are come back to reality, that, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. I want to just jump in here and say something, which is that apparently when we start talking about the role of the imagination in OCD, some people can apparently find that dismissive, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of somehow, oh, you're just making this stuff up, right? And I just want to speak to that. that that's not what the message here is, yeah. right? Right. And, and particularly sort of understanding that imaginal absorption is a normal experience. Mm -hmm. It's just that in OCD, all right, and this is useful, there's actually data to show mm -hmm. that people with OCD have a higher tendency to become imaginally absorbed, to get lost in their imagination. It actually is not only a state, it's, it seems to be a trait, all right? And there is also some evidence that they have a higher tendency to become depersonalized and derealized or to sort of have that kind of experience, all right? And what's interesting is those tendencies are unrelated to trauma, right? It's not that people who have had a traumatic experience are more likely to have these forms of a dissociation. That's not what the data shows. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing, which I will also point out that the work of Dr. Sofer Dudak points out is in people who are particularly prone to imaginal absorption, mm -hmm. and we could say probably prone to inferential confusion, which is which is the sort of cognitive explanation for what we're talking about, is that they tend to respond less well to standard treatment, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So this then speaks to this idea that it might be useful to address dissociative tendencies as part of treatment. And we can talk about what that might be down the road. But, but yeah. that's... It strikes me, and you talked about this a little bit too in the video that I'm going to link on this episode's blog post over at ICBT's YouTube channel. We had a really great presentation on this from Carl. But what I would say yeah. is, like, if you think about standardized treatment, let's take ERP, for example, and you're working with an OCD client. I mean, it's actually fairly common, low even level exposure to have somebody come up with an imaginal script and have them stay and hang, not break free of the imagination, but hang there in that script, in that distress, bathe in it, and then live your life anyway, right? You know, the response prevention is don't do any of your safety behaviors. Don't get out of this. In fact, getting out of that imaginal script, some people would say is avoiding, avoiding the trigger, avoiding the intrusive thought. And so how would you reconcile that? Because it's a very, very common tool used within ERP with this idea of, if I'm understanding you correctly, and if I'm understanding ICBT correctly, that really yanking ourselves out of that imagination and reorienting ourselves, being able to laugh it off and go, oh, it was a story. I was really up in that story in that moment. Like they kind of counteracts one another. And that's a really great question. And I will say, and this has to do with the fact that ICBT and ERP, which is really based on a behavioral model, see OCD very, very differently. So from within a behavioral model, the ERP model, imaginal exposure can make sense. Because what you're doing is, and this comes, ERP really sort of grew out of work on phobias and in many ways right? The behavioral model treats OCD as a phobic response. Mm -hmm. And so from within that framework to sort of expose yourself to the imagined, to what your imagination produces the and to, sort of learn yeah. to the possibility and to become immersed in the possibility that if there's some kind of habituation that goes on or some kind of learning that you can tolerate it, or, or some kind of inhibitory learning, it makes some sense. Mm -hmm. But personally, I don't do imaginal exposure. Or I've never found it to be particularly helpful. But I do think at the very least that most of us that treat OCD have had patients, when you do imaginal exposure, they really get lost. And that rather than it being particularly helpful is that it, it could sort of accentuate this tendency, mm -hmm. right? to become absorbed. And so 
personally, what I've found is, and to go back to your movie analogy is that imaginal exposure works best when the whole story collapses into absurdity. <laughs> when you just sort of carry it to such an extreme that the person sort of has this sort of realization, this is all bull crap, right? This, it, you know, it, this is just ridiculous, uh -huh. right? And that's when I find it to be most helpful. But I will say that from an ICBT model, if you see the fundamental problem as getting lost in the imagination and treating the imagination as if it's real, it doesn't make sense to rehearse that. Right. right, Because in some ways you are strengthening an already overdeveloped muscle. Now, again, that isn't to say that within the context of a behavioral phobic ERP model that it makes sense there. And again, this is why these approaches are different. Yeah. And there is more than one road to Rome. Yeah. Right? You know, it's interesting. My husband and I will binge watch shows sometimes after the kids go to bed or Sometimes we'll throw something on light in the background if we're working on something, or sometimes we'll play music. But one of the things my husband really likes to watch when we don't have a lot of time to invest in getting sucked in, absorbed into a whole series, is he likes to put on these little shorts. They're called Just for Laughs. It's a comedy group in Canada. And they do these little scenes where they're basically pranking people. And I was thinking about it as you were saying that because I was like, you know, that's it's interesting. I've never thought about it this way, but you've been watching just for last. People are really getting pulled into the story. And it speaks to that lived in piece that we were talking about, the lived in experience, because if they were using all their data in the here and now, which they are, it's this crazy reaction. Right. And they should be like, whoa, oh, my gosh, you know, what's going on? And then yeah. the illusion is broken, though. And you're like, hey, look over here. It's a camera. That's yeah. not what's going on. And part of why they're getting so swept in it is because they're using their sensory data. They're yeah. in that lived in experience. And I thought that's kind of a right. good analogy for what's happening yeah. for folks when they're yeah. living in the story, when they're yeah. in the bubble, when they're discussing yeah. things. Yeah. Now, one difference is, is that in OCD, right, there isn't sensory data. Right. You're, there isn't sensory data. That's that, you know, you know, for example, you see that the door is locked, you feel the door is locked, right? You hear that the door is locked, and yet you then question or doubt your sensory data, which is really different than when you get pranked. Right. Like in this show where where you're actually getting tricked by these illusions, right? But you're right, when you are, whatever the source is, whether it's coming in through the front door or the back door, when you are getting tricked, it feels real. Yeah. Right? This is what we mean by the lived-in experience. It can feel so real. And so when it feels so real, it's fully understandable that you have a strong urge to either compulse or avoid. It makes perfect sense. Right. Right. So again, I want to say that sort of saying, oh, this is all in your imagination. This is not to be at all dismissive. Right. 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 Because you're having that lived in experience. And yeah. this is part of any good magician is going to be like, look over here. We're not getting all the facts from what's going on over here because we, they have us so focused and zoomed into this granule of, yeah. 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 Let, let's, let's, let's talk about uh, the analogy of a magic show, Yeah, right? You go to a magic show, right? And you see a person sold in half. Right. You, 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 you can say that they're sort of split apart and they're the legs or, and the head, right? right? And, you know, and that you're being tricked. Now, what's interesting is, is that in a magic show, even though you don't understand how they did it, right? You, you understand that it's magic. So you don't call 911 and say, hey, come, so somebody is just a soul and a half, right? <laughs> right. But now, all right. So, so, so you're still maintaining a certain amount of awareness. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That you're being tricked. Mm -hmm. right? So that you don't react with a compulsion 
or avoid them. All right. Now, imagine, ima and I'm going to, okay, now use your imagination and imagine, and imagine Penn and Teller are at a David Copperfield show, right? And they're watching it and, and they're watching him create all of these illusions, right? Not only not being tricked, but they're saying, oh, right. I see how he did that. Isn't that clever how he created that illusion? That's what happens with ICBT. Right. That's, oh, I get, I see how, so, so we're not really sort of like, this is this idea that we're not, that we're not actually arguing with their story. We're just recognizing the ways that we have been led into or tricked into mm -hmm. becoming immersed in that story. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good point. And because our brain is our brain, it doesn't mean we'll never get tricked again, but our awareness and our ability to be, oh my gosh, I got caught up in that trick. That's a trick. I know that's a magic trick because once you know, just generally the premise of a magic trick, right? Then any magic show you go to, you're not going to go, but what if that one was real? You're going to be like, maybe I can't figure out how it was done, but I know it didn't really happen. And you know what? Sometimes yeah. you're like, oh, I really want to think about how they would have achieved that. And other times you might be like, I could give two toots here on yeah. why. Yeah. Right. But the most important thing to do is just know that it's a trick. And Absolutely. That, and that again, there's nothing that you need to do. Yeah. And that is so key too, because you don't have to do anything to prove it one way or the other. You don't have to go to 10 magic shows. I, I often give this when I'm training folks or when I'm talking with clients and talking about the magic trick. I talk about in very seriously about this guy. He has his hat. Right. And guess what? Get this empty. Nothing. Air. We, we can consider air something, but we're not going to parse details. Right. But there's nothing in it. And guess what? He puts his hand in and pulls out a whole ass rabbit, right? Like, holy crap, that rabbit wasn't there, right? And I'm like, is that not, like, mind-blowing? People are just kind of looking at me, and I'm like, right? Yeah. Oh, how, how is it done? We talk about the different ways that it can be done, and the table, trap door, whatever the thing, right? And so in looking at that, whether you understand where the rabbit was hiding or not, you know that the rabbit didn't materialize out of thin air. And there is nothing to do with that. You're like, it's a trick, right? Like, right. It's, it's, there is nothing to do with it. In ERP, we might go, okay, so if we, if we do this exposure hierarchy and we knock down our fear ladder here, it's like, what fear ladder? It's a rabbit pulled out of a box, right? Which is so, it's so revolutionary for the person and fam, you can, you can think about this for your loved one, right? Like how captivating, how hijacking the intrusive thought or obsessional doubt can be, depending on which kind of way you're conceptualizing OCD. And then to be able to blink and be like, it's a rabbit. It's a trick door. Who cares? Like to have that experience and be a person with lived experience of OCD, it is groundbreaking. It is. It's freeing. It's a thousand ton weight off of your chest, out of your amygdala, everything. It's revolutionary. It is. All right. So that brings us to the end of part one. And I know that this has been so good. So you will definitely want to come back, chew on this, think on it, attend thought to it. <laughs> and we'll come back and talk about this more next week with Carl Robbins. Okay. I'll see you. Thank you for that. Okay, so fam, we've really just skimmed the surface about dissociation and imaginal absorption, but I think we've laid some really important and interesting foundation for a deeper dive that'll happen next week. We also discussed OCD from an ICBT lens, and if you're newer to the family here, or maybe even just a recent diagnosis of OCD for you or your loved one, some of today's conversation may have felt confusing or foreign. Particularly if your only exposure, no pun intended, is to ERP. So if you felt lost at all during our conversation today, that's okay. I would even go so far as to say that's not unusual. 
And so I would highly recommend revisiting a few episodes from season one, including but not limited to season one, episode 20 and 21 with Mike Hetty, season one, episode 33 with Christina Orlova, or an overview during my summer series water cooler chat about ICBT. That's season one, episode 46. And if you watch it on YouTube, you can see all the Lego animations I created to help explain that a bit further. But also, here from Season 2's catalog, we had the co-founder of ICBT, Dr. Frederick Ardema, on Episode 56, and Katie Merritt, one of the foremothers of sharing about ICBT, and that can be found on Episode 64. And fam, if you're listening, you know, I, I got you. I know. I know how you listen to podcasts. I know how I listen to podcasts. You might be washing dishes or changing a diaper. You might be drifting off to sleep. It's okay. I know. I do it too. Or working out or driving. So I'm going to have all of those different episodes linked over at ocdfamilypodcast.com. You're just going to head on into this episode's blog and it will give you the hookup. And then for everyone here, you'll want to join us again next week because Carl is going to guide us through some experiential exercises. And I have found these really, really useful and helpful to explain concepts, even with my own clients and some of my family. And I have a hunch that you will find them pretty helpful, too. So again, next week, Carl will graciously hang out with us again and help us really understand imaginal absorption better, as well as what we can do about it. And I think that episode is super timely because like we were chatting about at the top of the show, we are in the throes of holiday season. Cutoffs, deadlines, maybe deductibles wrapping up or starting over, and so many other things wrapping up at the end of the year. And so it can become really easy to get absorbed in the story around it all. So I'm excited that we're going to have this timely discussion that can really help and reorient ourselves in the here and now. So for today's intrusive thought segment, which is the application segment of my show, I'm going to challenge us, fam, to get into our present tense vibes by challenging you to take the time this week to stop and smell the roses. Now, typically, when folks reference this idiom, they're encouraging us to slow down and appreciate the moment, see the beauty. But my angle on this popular expression is a little different. While surely you can breathe in these moments of joy, I want to honor and validate that often the holidays can be hard and painful for folks. And for the fam here, chances are pretty high that you and your loved ones are feeling the pain and wreckage OCD can create. So fam, if you stop to smell the roses and they smell sweet, more power to you. We love that for you. Savor that moment. But if you're struggling to stay above water here, first off, I want to say, I'm sorry life is so painful right now. I see you, I hear you, and you are not alone. So what do I mean by stopping to smell the roses then? Well, it's a charge for each of us to invest a bit of time, whether it's five seconds or five minutes, to breathe in our current moment. Literally, fam, breathe it in. What do you smell? What do you see? What do you hear? Breathe in what is in your here, your now and label it. Say it out loud if you want. Follow it to its source. Because when we take and create time to really breathe in and focus on our physical environment, our present realities, we really are grounding ourselves in this present moment. And in a season when presents are kind of a thing, one of the best presents we can give ourselves is grounding ourselves in reality. Because OCD, it swells in the imagination. So pick a thing, fam, whether it be literal roses, holly, mistletoe, I see you love birds, or the smell of dinner cooking, or maybe even the smell of the oven preheating. Does anybody else smell a smell when the oven is preheating? My son's nose is especially attuned to it because his pizza-centric brain is always cautiously optimistic that his favorite meal will be on the menu. Maybe it's taking in the sight of a throw pillow. Perhaps it makes you smile. Or maybe it annoys you because it's adorned with bunnies and colored eggs and a reminder that you just have not had time or energy to do anything in the midst of surviving. Whether the present is wonderful or weary-hearted, it's in the present. 
And while it can be so easy to get absorbed into the stories around the why, why is that still here? My challenge for you is to stop short of the chapter books with which we're all too familiar mm -hmm, and just recognize what it is in the present. It's here. It's on the couch. It's here. It's on the floor. It's here. That's the point. It's here. You're here. So what do you spy with your little eye fam? Take a moment, breathe it in, and then come back for our follow-up conversation with Carl because this intentionality around directing our attention in the present will be pretty useful as we discuss imaginal absorption a bit more. Until next week, fam. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD Family Podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit OCDFamilyPodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the download on the family chatter. Oh yeah says family like Carl and me talking about OCD. That's right. I went there. And you can too at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. <laughs>